welcome everybody to the party group on sustainable fashion and it's lovely to see you in this dying few days before the parliament rises at the end of tomorrow um, the purpose of the meeting is to um, have a briefing on the um, very low quality um, bordering on the abusive purchasing practices in the garment supply chains over the last two years and to look at unfair commercial practices by UK retailers and also um, the role which is being proposed of the fashion watchdog, um, also known as the garment trading adjudicator. Um, we had a meeting with the minister recently, which I'm sure Tamara will feed back about, um, and we are trying to get this some coverage within the government and some profile, because what we want to see is fairness within the supply chains and to know that um, the clothes that we put on or that we purchase um, uh, have been made fairly and lawfully. So um, today's meeting has been organised to um, hear some of the evidence and some of the solutions and I'm looking very um, much forward to hearing from Professor Mohammed Az Azul Salam and also from some workers. We've got a video to hear and Dr. Do Chunya Chi Chi from the Research Centre for Employment Relations in Vietnam and Fiona Gooch, the Senior Policy Advisor at Tradecraft Exchange. Um, and we hope also to hear from Mary Cray, our councillor Adam Clark and John McNally. Um, and that John, of course, is a member of the EAC and I can see John here on my screen. So um, without further ado, is our first speaker, Tamara, the professor? Yes, it is. So Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. So it be, yes, it is. Thank you. Um, could you please give us um, your presentation? Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the project uh, sponsored by uh, UKRI um, and the research called by uh, Modern Slavery um, Policy and Evidence Center, uh, sh shortly Modern Slavery PEC. And the project um, uh, titled The Impact of COVID-19 on women workers in Bangladesh garment industry. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, as you know, um, as you, you all aware of you know, brands behavior during uh, COVID time, particularly early period of COVID uh, time, um, uh, the brands uh, or clothing retailers uh, canceled orders. Um, then they sought price reductions, uh, 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 so discounts from suppliers, and in one estimate, uh, the status of, uh, of three billion US dollar of orders uh, to around uh, more than eleven hundred uh, Bangladeshi factories was uh, uh, was on limbo or unclear as of uh, April twenty twenty. It is actually only only the, at the beginning of uh, COVID nineteen time. And in response uh, to that, uh, suppliers in Bangladesh reacted very negatively. I mean, they fired uh, workers immediately uh, when they, they heard uh, orders had been canceled. Uh, then uh, they also uh, reduced uh, salary. Uh, they they forced, to, forced workers to do unpaid overtime. Uh, then they were also forced to return work during government you know legal lockdown when you know government announced lockdown then they return home to their villas uh, workers actually return to their villas then then uh, the violating the rules so oh, factory owners called workers back and then they rushed they camp into uh, she you know in in boat or rails or buses you know to to get back to the factories next slide please uh, the data we got uh, from uh, garments workers in Bangladesh, we interviewed uh, uh, workers, uh, 80 workers in total, and then 12 video cases, in addition to interviewing uh, ILO uh, members, uh, UN women, uh, and then uh, BGME presidents, uh, and some other uh, suppliers. We got... Uh, uh, um, data suggests uh, uh, there are some 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 direct impacts 
uh, on women and there are some indirect impacts. For example, the direct impacts, for example, job losses, massive job losses. Uh, in one uh, estimate, you know, reported by Reuters, uh, like 2.8 million workers were affected and then 70,000 uh, workers were laid off since April until June 2020. This is just, you know, uh, fast three months, you know, so, uh, during COVID time. And then what happened? So those who lost job, they, they went back, uh, went to their, their, their villages and also uh, to live there. And then th those who remained in the factories, they had to do overtime, uh, unpaid overtime, and they are not paid for their work. And there was, a, there was unrealistic target. So supervisor in the factory and managers put a uh, set unrealistic targets uh, so, uh, so that the workers would meet up their targets and they used uh, verbal you know, abuses. Um, in some instances outside and inside factories, we also got evidence of sexual abuses, but the verbal abuses were, were much more prep, you know, uh, vigilant, uh, much more prevalent uh, during that time. And there are also physical violence um, uh, outside the factories. Those who lost jobs, those workers who lost jobs, those uh, uh, remain unpaid. They started demonstrating outside the factories and roadsides, and then they are beaten up somehow. And, and we don't know actually who are, who beat up, but we know that actually, you know, so they're beaten up. And when you, when you say unrealistic production targets, to meet unrealistic production target, we saw even before COVID time, uh, you know, the supervisors use verbal abuses as a tool, as a control tool, uh, uh, psychological pressure on employees, workers to do, uh, to, to finish their jobs. Next slide, please. Uh, I want to show then again uh, some indirect impacts we got uh, from our data. Uh, the financial pressures, mostly um, women suffered financial pressures. Um, something like the, the women workers loaned um, from their relatives um, and friends, and then eventually they are failed to, to, to pay back somehow. And then, as you know, that the working condition, I mean, particularly, I would say, you know, the, the living conditions of garments workers in Bangladesh, if you know, uh, you would see that most of the garments workers live in slums uh, areas, or some, all slums actually located in Dhaka city. Um, that actually slums living condition is, is very poor, uh, even before COVID, um, you know, and then uh, when COVID disrupted uh, and a global trade, uh, things got worse. And if you enter this slum area, you know, you see the living condition, you know, in the morning, one toilet shared by hundreds of people. And you imagine during COVID time, you know, situation, you know, is terrible. Uh, and then um, uh, we, we, our, you know, the research photographer actually took, took this picture, you know, from inside, uh, inside uh, uh, you know, in a slum in Dhaka city. Uh, then we have uh, also got, you know, the, when you see the faces of, you know, workers uh, uh, that they, they, you can you can imagine to see just so, to see their face, they're tired, they're, they're depressed, and women most likely, you know, they are they are starving because once they have a limited food, they feed their they feed you know their children first, and then their husband, uh, and the remaining food they eat. So you see that the food deficiency, you know, uh, has, a, has had a terrible impacts on women. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, how, how can you reflect uh, on this, uh, you know, on these findings? Um, I, we got, uh, uh, you know, the evidence from, from in the factories, uh, you know, from the workers working in the factories, uh, their supply uh, clothes uh, to UK market, particularly. And uh, we found actually it's a slavery condition. So slavery condition prompted by UK retailers actions. If you see the actions at the beginning, they cancel lots of orders. And that actually in turn impacted, you know, so it's a, it is a slavery conditions. 
And uh, if you look at them, I mean, I mean, also my other piece of research, and you know, I looked at, uh, uh, you know, uh, Modern Slavery Act 2015, UK Modern Slavery uh, Act 2015, the, the paper published in Journal of Business, Business Ethics, which is actually, you know, uh, Times, uh, you know, a 50 ranking journal, uh, so which is also, you know, great piece, uh, I, I can see actually that, that paper discusses and provided a critical overview of UK Modern Slavery Act. I can connect it, you know, well, with, that, with that article and the findings we have got here. Uh, UK government's inaction is surprising uh, despite the leadership behind the Modern Slavery Act and subsequent reviews of, of the act. We know that the recently you know, act has been reviewed, uh, but there's a lack of action. There's lack of leadership to, you know, to hold retailers accountable. Uh, uh, for their unfair practices. Uh, so now we want to uh, show uh, experiences of three Bangladeshi workers in uh, British retailer supply chains. So it would be a short video. Uh, so thank you so much for listening to me. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me later. Thank you so much. পার্শ্বপতি যারা থাকে তারা গার্মেন্টস ফ্যাক্টরিতে যায় তখন বলছেন যে তুমি অনেক কষ্টে আছো আমাদের সাথে ফ্যাক্টরিতে চলো গার্মেন্টসে ওখানে যাইলে ভালো বেতন অবেটন হবে এই জন্য আমরা মাধ্যমে তখন গার্মেন্টসে যাই কাজের ক্ষেত্রে ভালো ব্যবহার করে যে সময় আমার কাজ খারাপ হয় তখন অবশ্যই আমার সাথে খারাপ ব্যবহার করে আর ফিনিশিং এ আপনার যেখানে লোক লাগবে 50 জন সেখানে লোক রাখে মাত্র 15 জন টানা কাজ করা লাগে खुबी खराब छो लकडाउन मोबाइल Uh, this is Tamara here from the um, from the Secretariat. Thank you so much for that very moving video. Thank um, you. Um, that was amazing, Professor, and really good to hear directly from the women. And I believe Tamara will now move on to um, Dr. Chu, the Re Research Centre for Employment Relations in Vietnam. And welcome from such a long way away. It's really lovely to have you on the call. Thank you very much and good afternoon, uh, also good evening from my side. 
So it is um, uh, an honor for me today to be invited to share with you the outcome of uh, two, actually two surveys. So um, uh, Professor Azizu has just shared with you what happened last year, the first year of COVID. Um, and Vietnam, as well as Bangladesh and many other garment producing countries have suffered from massive order cancellation. However, what I'd like to share with you is what just happened two months ago. So these uh, surveys were conducted in September this year. Next slide, please. And for this year, uh, we tried to look again at uh, the impacts of COVID, but also the purchasing practices of the uh, fashion buyers to see whether that has changed. In this survey, we look at 256 biggest garment and footwear manufacturers in Vietnam, and they uh, employ nearly half a million of workers. And this was the time very difficult for the garment industry in Vietnam because the lockdown was applied to the southern provinces of Vietnam, which is the biggest hub for garment producing in the country for almost four months, uh, more than four months actually. And 65% of the garment companies were suspended and the rest were operating only at 20 to 30 capacity. As a result, 82% of the garment footwear and manufacturers could not complete orders on time. Next slide, please. And um, because this is the second year of COVID, we thought that the buyers would be more prepared uh, because of the situation. But what we found out from the survey was um, new but unfair um, purchasing practices. We found that 12% of the Vietnamese manufacturers had to pay compensation for the orders that were canceled because of the lockdown. So, and 21% of them had the orders canceled at the same time they received not a single penny for the materials that had already purchased and the labor cost already engaged in production. And 68% of the manufacturers reported that they faced with fines from the buyers for late delivery. And these fines not only uh, include like normal fines, but include also the responsibility to cover air freight cost. And you can't imagine how expensive it is. The manufacturers told me that air freight cost may not only eat up all of the profit margin for that order, but also all the profit for half year of production for them. And we compare the manufacturers that receive orders directly from the brands and retailers and those who have to work through intermediary agents. And we found that the latter ones suffer much more uh, from order cancellation and fines and air freight cost. Next, please. And we have some testimonies from the manufacturers here. For example, one said that the buyers canceled our in-production orders and shifted to China and Indonesia, Indonesia in the middle of the lockdown. We, uh, the manufacturers, asked the buyers for late delivery. They insisted on price reduction of 15%. In the end, the buyers are the master of the game. We have to abide by, otherwise we would not have orders to sustain production. This is the reason why the manufacturers will rarely negotiate with the buyers upon uh, order cancellation or price reduction or whatever that are imposed on them. Next, please. And we conducted another survey with 300 workers in September 2021, and most of them are women. And more important is that nearly half of these women are actually the main or the only breadwinner of their family. And uh, 74% of them have children to support or old parents to support. However, we found that um, when 73% of the garment and footwear workers in the southern provinces, like millions of them, were followed for four months or more, but 62% of these followed workers did not receive any pay from the companies because the many companies faced with the threat of bankruptcy due to order destruction, high air shipping cost, and many other problems that were pushed on them from the buyers. Next, please. And we call it the double crisis. 
The first crisis is that the workers were living in the center of the pandemic. During that time, every day, there were more than 10,000 new cases and the mortality rate was among the highest in Asia. The second crisis was that the women workers suffered from hunger. We found that 30% of the women workers reported that they suffered from intermittent hunger during the lockdown because they have no uh, income left, uh, no savings left. 16% of them lack essential medicine and the rate of domestic violence doubled to 53%. And we have two testimonies from the workers here. One was a lady, 31 year old, and she had to, she has two uh, small children. And she said that for the past few weeks, we only had rice with vegetables given to us by the neighbors. My little son is pale and sick. I constantly suffer from stomachache because of hunger. I cannot afford a phone, a smartphone for my daughter to study online. In another case, it's a 45 year old government workers who have to support not just three kids, and one of which is disabled, but also her husband who lost his job as a platform driver. And the husband has turned quite aggressive towards her during the lockdown because she was not able to uh, support the family as usual. Next, please. So what I'd like to recommend here are four recommendations. The first one is that too much focus has been paid on the purchasing practices of the retailers, but we seem to forget that the intermediary agents play a huge role in the um, uh, sustainability of the fashion supply chains. So agents and retailers should be monitored within, uh, with regards to their purchasing practices. The second is that the retailers and vendors who are the ones that enjoy the biggest profit margin in the fashion supply chain should put money into a fund to support the workers in their supply chains during crisis. Because this is not just the responsibility of the producing country and the manufacturers. And during the false major situation, dumping all the risk and losses by retailers and agents onto the, uh, onto the manufacturers should be regarded as unethical. And finally, we think that it's very essential to have a confidential hotline so that the manufacturers can report unethical purchasing practices in a safe way and also to have these practices to be investigated and stopped. That's all for me. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Doctor. That was an excellent presentation and very worrying to see the 53% increase in uh, in domestic violence and that's some, something we have seen here in the UK as well but it's very stark to see it there from those garment workers point of view. Um, Fiona Gooch who is the senior policy advisor at Tradecraft Exchange will be sharing excerpts from supplier survey Tradecraft Exchange commissioned and then how abusive purchasing practices can be stopped by a fashion watchdog. Fiona, over to you before we hear from our expert panel. Thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. That's great. That's very helpful. So first of all, huge thanks to the APPG for um, hosting us and inviting um, me to speak. So the first thing I'd like to explain is that um, this is the overall trend that happens in supply chains which is that retailers and brands put pressure down the supply chain onto the manufacturers and in the agricultural sector, it's onto farms. And ultimately that is borne by workers. So that is the general trend that, of what we've got. So if they want something fast, then it will drive um, quite a relentless work rate at the production unit. So that the effects of decisions that happen here are felt all over the world by workers. Next slide, please. So last year we had in our newspapers, we were very much aware that COVID had disrupted trade and this was having massive impacts. And we heard sort of just examples. So we heard of cancellations, very significant amounts of money just being owed to um, manufacturers in one company, sorry, one country, apologies. Discounts in the order of 30%. That means that suppliers are subsidizing production, hugely delayed payment terms. Next slide, please. 
So what we did was we commissioned a survey from Nicole Higgins, and this survey was conducted between December 2020 and April 21, asking suppliers about their impact that they had experienced in the previous year. We did huge outreach to a lot of suppliers and presented to a lot of different trade associations, but because of the climate of fear amongst the supplier sector, only 42 replied. So we need to take these survey results with that in mind. But the reason I wanted to share this today is because it is complementing what we've heard before. The suppliers that were involved in this survey are sourcing from China, India and the UK. And so essentially is telling a slightly different story to what we've just heard. And very importantly, it's relevant to the UK market because the majority of them were selling to customers with the headquarters in the UK. Next slide, please. So the first thing to say is all but one of the suppliers had a change to their orders applied to them after the contract had been agreed. And the chart at the bottom shows whether or not the change applied was a price change, a delivery change, what it was. Then to say that the majority, a huge amount, 86% had orders cancelled, 80% had their payment terms um, extended, 40% 40 40 by 30 days and 40% by more than 60 days. And what is really surprising when you think about the consequences on suppliers is only six sought legal advice. Next slide, please. And that is because of the enormous climate of fear in this sector. So here are some different quotes that came from suppliers um, who answered the survey. So a 50% discount being asked on goods, otherwise they won't be paid at all. And this is for product already made. That means the materials have already been bought, the workers have already done the work. And now we have a retailer threatening to pay only 50% or not at all. Then a comment that many buyers all behave the same, which is that they essentially um, can delay or cancel new product launches at very short notice, but then they expect the supply always to be there. And they don't think about the consequences on stock levels, forecasting, and the ability for manufacturing to actually get back up to speed again. And the main thing to again get across, which I think is a key characteristic of talking about this problem, is that suppliers are too scared to complain in case they lose that particular buyer. There's no power with the manufacturer. Next slide, please. So what did the suppliers want to see as key improvements? Well, fair pricing, realistic production forecasting came up high, but the other place where there's huge consistency is no retrospective changes. That's actually what suppliers consider to be the worst followed by general comments about unfair terms and conditions in the contracts. Next slide, please. So the reason why purchasing practices matter is that we've known for a long time about the impact on um, wages and working conditions. But as far back as 2017, the International Labour Organization produced a report that highlighted the impact of different types of purchasing practices and this time on wages. And what you can see is that if the purchasing practices expect flexibility, which means changing orders at short notice, have inaccurate technical specifications or are changing prices, so the supplier is used to having discounts applied to them at short notice, all of that has negative impacts on the hourly wage. What is good practice, is that if a buyer is going to pay at least the production costs and the supplier has the confidence of that, you can see an uplift to the hourly wage. So the purchasing practices have got a direct impact on wages. Next slide, please. So we saw the impact on workers and uh, when the newspaper headlines talked about Leicester. Next slide, please. And there was a much bigger, more global impact on workers overseas because the bulk of production for the UK retail market happens abroad. So the estimates were that more than 12 billion pounds worth of clothes have not been paid for, billions of wages are owed, and the International Labour Organization talks of workers in extreme hardship. And so we have heard from um, 
University of Aberdeen professor about the hunger that existed last year, just after COVID hit, and most recently from Dr. Chi, who explained that people now, just as recently as this autumn, have been starving because the brands have failed to improve their purchasing practices when they should have learned from 2020. Unfortunately, UK retailers can be amongst the worst. And that is um, that there's not a reason for why the UK retailers are amongst the worst, but the scale of the impacts is enormous. If you think that, let's say, one company might be buying from more than 100 factories, that's, for example, in a single country. If a single factory employs, let's say, a thousand workers, you can see how the numbers mount up and that decisions in this country have huge impacts abroad. Next slide, please. So what is needed? Well, we have basically heard that brands actions are unlawful because in many cases they are breaching contracts and agreements, and they are certainly unethical. The systematic dumping of risks and unexpected costs onto suppliers. We also need to reflect, unfortunately, that voluntary initiatives have been ineffective. There have been a range of voluntary initiatives from the smallest scale, which is the best efforts of organizations like myself, uh, which is Tradecraft Exchange and others who ran the pay up campaign. We pushed the brands very hard last year to honor their contracts, but it was just a small drop in the ocean, the small improvements that we managed to achieve. And we tried very hard, 16,000 campaigners from Tradecraft Exchange wrote to 14 brands and many, many more through the pay up campaign as well. Multi-stakeholder initiatives have also attempted to try and get their retailers to improve, but they cannot uh, because the, of the amount of money that is involved. And unfortunately, the UK's prompt payment code is effectively voluntary as well, and that is ineffective. The solution that we need is a regulator. And we know that it will work because the food retailers have been regulated for the past uh, eight years and it, the prevalence of abusive purchasing practices has been has reduced. So 79% of suppliers in 2014 experienced abusive purchasing practices from the UK's 13 largest food retailers. And as a result of this food regulator called the Groceries Code Adjudicator, that has dropped to 29% in 2021. And you and I as consumers have not seen a change to the products that we are receiving on the shelves as a result of those purchasing practices improving. Next slide, please. So we can see very clearly if we compare just the same companies, but one set of products is regulated and the other set of products is not regulated, how the payment terms vary. And in the worst case, Marks and Spencers is paying food supplies in 19 days and clothing supplies in 120 days. Next slide, please. So what are the key features that we need to see in a fashion watchdog that will regulate the purchasing practices of retailers selling clothing and fashion items in the UK market? Well, the first thing is anonymous complaints. As we've explained, suppliers are very afraid of coming forwards. I tried to help the organizers of this meeting also to invite suppliers to speak. They are too afraid to speak in a public forum. The second design criteria is that the regulator must be able to do own initiative investigations. And that will stop the brands and the retailers who might be subject to an investigation going searching for the complainant. These two criteria are critical. Then the third comment for the design criteria is that there must be dissuasive penalties. It is extremely profitable to effectively not pay your suppliers for months and months or to not pay them what they are owed. So the profitability of abusive purchasing practices is something we need to keep in mind. So the penalties applied by this regulator need to be significant. Obviously to enforce a statutory code, it must act across all suppliers so that it isn't that one set of suppliers are advantaged whilst another is disadvantaged and that the largest retailers need to be in scope. It's not about whether or not the retailers are good or bad. The issue is that the retailers have enormous power relative to their suppliers, and that is what gives them the intrinsic ability to treat their suppliers so badly. 
these are the criteria that already exist with the groceries code adjudicator, which is the food regulator. Next slide, please. So my challenge to those of you in parliament and a big request, we consider that it's time for the Department for Business to act. Otherwise, unfortunately, it seems that foul play will continue as normal with consequences for slavery and serious levels of hunger all over the world. Thank you for your time. Well, Helen, thank you for Fiona. Thank you for that um, very stark um, presentation with some very worrying statistics there. And uh, I agree on the need for regulation. I think it seems to have worked to some degree with the grocery um, manu regulator. And now I think we need to move to that position ourselves, particularly in, of course, the post-Brexit environment where um, there's actually an opportunity for a homegrown approach um, and where there are a number of questions there to be answered as well. So a, a regulate, regulator could look at both what's going on in some of our own um, fashion um, warehouses, as well as um, the practice of importing um, so much um, from the Global South. Um, I'm really pleased now to move on to the, um, uh, the, the panel, our Mary Cray, who was the chair of the first ever 27 to 2019 Environmental Audit Committee and really led the way in beginning to talk about fast fashion. Um, and I think actually some of the improvements that we've seen, for example, I visited my local Primark recently and they have actually begun to move away from purchasing from the Xinjiang region due to the um, concerns around um, the Uyghur people. And all those cultural changes did actually start to shift during Mary Cray's um, leadership of um, the Environmental Audit Committee. And we've also got Councillor Adam Clark, Deputy City Mayor of Leicester, where of course we have some of our best known um, suppliers, but also um, we do have some examples of best practice, which I hope uh, Councillor Clark will remind us of, but also some work to do in order to show the way for other centres trying to develop a homegrown approach. Um, and of course, John McNally, um, a member of our group and member of the Environmental Audit Committee to bring us up to speed on what um, other learning has come out of the current EAC. So with no further ado, Mary, what are your reflections of where we're at compared to where we were when you were chairing the group? Thanks very much indeed, Catherine. And can I preface my remarks by saying that I do now act um, as an advisor to one of the big um, global brands. So I just want people to be absolutely uh, aware of that. Um, well, I was reflecting on uh, this as, as our amazing speakers were speaking. We have today a pair of Nike trainers that you can pay £40,000 for and they don't actually exist. So, you know, if, if we wanted to have any more clear uh, symbol of the insanity of the fashion and footwear industry, it's got to be £40,000 for a pair of non-existent trainers. Just a reminder, our inquiry, um, as you said, uncovered a huge amount um, of the scandalous abuse of uh, labour, um, not just in overseas markets and suppliers, but also here in our own country. And, um, you know, whether it's Leicester, London, Manchester, we heard stories of fire exits being padlocked, um, auditors being chased, uh, people uh, receiving wages as little as £3.50 an hour. And we made a whole series of recommendations to government uh, as part of that. I think as a consumer, it is incredibly difficult for people to sift the different brands. Um, it's more than one person can do to sift through, are they a member of Ethical Trading Initiative? Have they signed up to the race for zero? Are they going to get to net zero carbon emissions? But actually, we as specialists can actually look at that. We can look at the different initiatives that the brands are doing. And there are still some brands uh, who have failed to sign even the most basic of standards. So the ETI in the UK, I would say, is an absolute basic. I would say the ACT by the um, ILO, um, which allows workers wherever they are in the world to unionize and to um, have freedom of association, which unfortunately those workers in Bangladesh 
Ash, who spoke on video, were not able to do or didn't feel able to do. So freedom of association uh, through the ACT programme run by the ALO, I think those are the two minimums um, that all UK brands should be signing up to. Um, I think we've seen a lot of talk about carbon uh, with COP26 in Glasgow, and there is no doubt that some of the changes that uh, came about as a result of the Environmental Audit Committee's work, not just into fashion, but also into carbon and carbon reporting, mean that, uh, and green finance, mean that now investors in all of these brands are asking some very difficult questions. They're asking questions about sustainability. They're asking questions about net zero. They're asking questions about the supply chain. And what we're seeing very slowly, and it is the Titanic moving slowly, is the brands are waking up to the fact that now the money is going to follow the most sustainable brands. But I think we need to widen the definition of sustainability, which can be a bit devalued and talk about responsibility. So the responsibility not to destroy nature, the responsibility to recycle clothes in store, the responsibility to think about volumes um, and to think about how we get to that circular economy. And um, I think um, the government is in the middle of consulting, it's finished the consultation on an extended producer responsibility for textiles. And I think that would be a very important part of moving to that circular economy. Um, and I do think um, that there is a role here for a uh, fashion adjudicator. The Groceries Code adjudicator has done very significant and positive work to stop abuses against farmers here in the UK. I would say, I'm sure what the civil servants on the call are saying is this will be a big challenge in terms of how do we um, monitor the supply chain um, in places like Vietnam, in places like Mexico, in places like Bangladesh. But I would also argue back that we are more connected now than we have ever been, that um, artificial intelligence and blockchain allows brands to really specify and be really clear about what they're doing. So I was interested in Dr. Doe's um, point about the, the, the factories that worked with agents had particularly large problems. In a supply chain, there is no need to work with an agent if you can, um, if you're, you know, we want strategic partnerships in order to, uh, make sure that the brands can are closer to their suppliers. And I think that's what we'll see the best of the brands doing as we go forward. So I certainly think this is an idea that wasn't recommended by us, but one whose time may well have come. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Mary. Your crisp um, approach, always valued. Um, and Councillor Clark, could you give us a bit of a snapshot as to what's happening in Leicester the best practice, but also some of the issues that you think are still quite hard nuts to crack. I, I shall try. Yeah, first I should probably say I haven't deliberately worn a shirt to match your um, your slides, but I sometimes seem to that's very serendipitous of me. Um, the um, look, I'm really delighted to, uh, to, to to be invited to talk today, but it's probably worth noting that before I get on to Leicester specifically, in such a diverse city, um, we've got special connections with places like Bangladesh, and I see promotion of an ethical and sustainable supply chain here and around the world as a reflection of our adoption of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, but what I really want to do is to make an argument for how this proposed watchdog has the potential to be a critical piece of a jigsaw that can help Leicester's textile sector to be the best that it can be, driving out bad jobs, and welcoming even more good jobs into, into the city that I represent. Leicester's got a really long, proud history of garment manufacturing and textiles remains um, an incredibly important employer. They did in fact used to say that Leicester clothes the world, a very grand statement. We still have the second largest concentration of textile firms in the country and the largest for, for garment manufacturer, employing over a fifth of the UK workforce. It's part of our past and it's absolutely necessary for our future. But here, the sector is crucial to the local economy um, currently, and it's a priority alongside the food sector, interestingly enough, um, given the alignment we're talking about with the grocery adjudicator. Uh, the food sector in Leicester is even bigger than the textile sector. But given the size of the sector here, well publicized 
issues led to the mayor convening his own um, round table event in 2017. Um, and since then, we've been making strides in the area. And as you alluded to, we think there are examples of good practice. We've established the Leicester Labour Market Partnership and employed a coordinator to bring uh, enforcement, uh, voluntary sector and other agencies together um, to share intelligence more efficiently. We're working with our trade unions to support local workers with their employment rights and we're working with a local enterprise partnership supported more than 200 businesses, 200 textile manufacturers um, to, um, to take forward ethical compliance in the workplace. And only in the last fortnight, we've launched the Fashion Textile uh, Te Technology Academy um, in the heart of the garment district. And that's not only gonna teach garment skills, or already is today teaching garment skills, um, but it's also going to teach English language and, and workers' rights as well. And we've received government funding um, to extend that work, to work with De Montfort University um, and work with suppliers as well. But one key plank is, is our lobbying of government to improve, um, uh, to improve the situation for appropriate legislation, powers and resources to drive the change that is still needed and will always be needed. This is an, this is an ongoing journey. So over the last 18 months or so, I've spent a lot of time with suppliers and manufacturers all over the city of Leicester and in the particular district where some issues have been found. And I've tried to understand with compliant manufacturers what, me what makes others fall into unethical exploitative practice. And time and time again, I have been told that some manufacturers are not equipped to respond robustly to aggressive purchasing practices. I was told that young and inexperienced buyers in particular um, who are trying to make their way in industry can be particularly difficult to negotiate with pushing for prices that could only be achieved by compromising ethical practices. Then beyond that, the cards are always in the brand's hands by um, it ends up leading to cancellations, changing volumes, changing technical specs, uh, demanding discounts um, and delaying the payment terms that we heard Fiona talk about earlier. So, and also a, a, a key one for me is as we push for that great sustainability in fashion that, that Mary um, uh, so eloquently uh, mentioned, um, we, want, um, we want volumes to be smaller. We, want, we don't want a third of what is produced going to waste. Um, and in that, we're going to want um, volumes to be smaller and production on demand is going to become something that's, that's going to be more, in, uh, more, more greatly and vociferously introduced into the market. And that will put pressures on manufacturers and the way they work. And so I think not only for, for um, pre-COVID, for during COVID, um, but also into the future as the sector um, as the sector emerges in, in a different in a different space, um, we do need an intervention like the like 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 the adjudicator or the watchdog to support good practice. Um, I do think this did, would need to be developed with suppliers with manufacturers. So I invite anyone who's interested to come to Leicester to meet those suppliers who are. Um, sometimes afraid to talk publicly about the issues that they experience, um, but I'm sure would would very much be be, you know, be welcoming of an opportunity to talk to people in private about the issues they're experiencing and how a watchdog might support them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor, and some excellent um, reflections there. I was just thinking myself, as you're talking about volume, we're only a, a mile away from Oxford Street here, and I was thinking about all those winter clothes, which probably will not be purchased because of Omicron, and thinking about if you look at the, the product on the shelf or the hanger and work backwards from there and think about all the issues around the supply chain. I mean, COVID has really put a spotlight, but perhaps through this crisis and the pain that it's brought us, maybe we can learn to do things a bit better. Our final present, um, a final few words is from John McNally, our member, um, who will also give us a Scottish perspective and update us on the work of the committee currently, the EAC. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks very much, Catherine. Um, I, I made some notes for you, but before I start, obviously, first of all, I'd like to say uh, thanks for the invitation to the APPG. Uh, on fashion and indeed this is extremely important that we have this watchdog event and I'm happy to speak on behalf of the, the EAC. Uh, Philip Dunn asked me if I would come along and uh, I think he's led a, 
Environment Audit Committee particularly well and ad admirably, I have to say, through these extremely difficult times. So it's good to see some, some familiar faces and friends, Mary. Thank you very much. And it was really enjoyed all the contributions. Can I say this? The, um, and locally in the whole, the whole of the, the Falkirk area and the surrounding area, having visited a lot of the schools prior to COP26 and indeed managing to get some of our local schools to go to the New York Times event at COP26, the interest in fashion is absolutely astonishing in their knowledge, the children's knowledge, you know, from primary school to even the senior secondary school, they're all quite um, alarmed with the practices that go on in the fashion industry and they're very, very, very much aware of uh, the need to change. But I'll give you a, a brief outline on the evidence their committee's inquiries on fiction fashion and the sort of follow-ups to that. So we found that although there were encouraging signs that's been made earlier in the industry, there's been some progress on the environment and sustainability. We generally express frustration on the lack of progress in some areas as had been mentioned earlier, notably on labour exploitation, particularly mention of the ongoing working conditions in Leicester was a, was a big one. And we've just heard earlier on about the, the practices in Bangladesh and Vietnam and the lack of payment. So these, these are all getting very well evidenced now. So the labour behind the label, labour behind the label, they stated that despite the fiction fashion report, the UK government had been inclined to more inertia and did not take progressive steps to address all, any of the issues raised and rejected, as you probably all know, all of the recommendations made at the inquiry. They, as others have commented, it's an unfathomable dis decision and I'm sure we will have hear more comments as we go along. And sometimes on a personal nature, when you hear things that you can't work out, these unfathomable, unfathomable decisions, I think if you can't work it out, you try to follow the money. And the money link here is absolutely so abundantly clear. The comparison that was made earlier between the agriculture and the fashion industry payments is just an absolute clear example of the pure, pure practices that are going on. And the, the, the BRAC, BRC, they pr proposed a fit to trade a license model to replace current industry uh, audits. Uh, for example, they will provide better tracking of tax payments I'm curious as to the update in that proposal. Also, the TUC, they supported a license model, told the EAC that would help, which would help prevent exploitation, improve intelligence gathering, ensure prosecutions to worst offenders. And I think that could be a very busy job for somebody. There seems to be so much of it going on. A year ago, just now, the Tradecraft Exchange made an excellent case for regulation of pricing decisions, purchasing practices of brands, which, as you will all know, suppliers have an uncommonly high dependency of single brand buyers. And this bad standard, this poor practice, again, will continue until regulations intervene. And the uh, interesting, again, the, the core coalition, including the Labour behind the Labour Locks Farm and the Trade, Trade Fair Exchange, proposed an apparel watchdog that we're hearing about just now. The, the interest... Uh, and I think the interesting for me worth noting was Matthew Taylor, the former director of Labour Market Enforcement, who gave evidence to us. He made a couple of very interesting observations. Uh, he said that these proposals were worthy of exploration, but he also said that an adjudicator was certainly a good step forward. His point being, there's not much point in having a licensing system, a scheme in place, unless it's properly resourced, adding that such a scheme could maybe drive businesses underground, but I think what he did suggest with the compliance kite mark scheme would be market would be market advantage to good ethical businesses. And I I know that Mary and I, when we sat years ago, I think one of the best things we did. I, I love the idea of public humiliation, putting companies in the modern forms of the stocks where people can bring to attention the poor standards that they practiced. And again, it seems to be quite strange at this time when ethical money and moral money seem to be at the forefront and these practices are still going on. So to conclude, uh, Chair, the EAC wrote to the Secretary of State stating that there is some merit to a licensing approach, but does appear to place responsibility and the burdens on the suppliers. Uh, the recommendation of the government evaluate the garment trade adjudicator model 
consult with businesses to achieve this, basically, and the DEIS reply noted the idea of an adjudicator, noted that, mentioned the comparison in the Groceries Code Adjudicator and the Groceries Supply Code, and we need to understand that model applied to the garment industry, adding it had consulted with the previous director of the Labour Market Enforcement Policy for a single enforcement body. Then last point to end, I believe the Home Office introduced a sense or a series of modern day slavery measures last September as a result, maybe the pressure that you guys are putting on and maybe our own EAC. So I think uh, what we've heard today just emphasise what we've been saying, that the practice are bad and we need to try to bring it to bring the government to pressure them to change the, the rules and the regulations. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. And I was reflecting when you were talking about the naming and shaming of companies about the work that the EAC has recently done on the water companies and the yeah. sewage outfalls and the fact that it's been such a successful committee in terms of exploring the facts and figures and leading to um, real culture change, because that was a very, very significant debate when it then came back into the Environment Bill. So the committee that Mary started out with chairing, which seemed to be a little bit obscure at the time, has gone to be one of the most um, important committees in Parliament. I also briefly wanted to say that with the tightening of the labour market, now is a very good time really to be looking at workers' conditions. I note that ASDOR, which is a retail um, union, um, made an announcement yesterday that it had come to a deal with Tesco around some of the pet workers there in retail. And um, to me, that feels like um, more of a civilised society and something which I hope those in fashion can also um, call for and be successful in gaining. Um, and my final point was just to uh, underline what um, one of our contributors, Anastasia Woyuka, said in the chat, which was, Don't, let's not forget the um, question of quality of design, not just quantity. And also what this group has done, the All Party Group has looked into as well, is looking at fabrics which are more em environmentally fab uh, friendly. So that um, when you do get the um, huge volumes of um, clothes through, that those fabrics are better designed so that they have um, a lifetime which is not too unsustainable. I'm afraid we have come to the end of our group um, now with about two minutes to go. Tamara, would you like to say anything to finish us off? Uh, thank you very much, Catherine, and thank you to all our participants and speakers. I know Mary um, from Sustainable Fashion Scotland had raised her hand, so if she wants to quickly just put something in the chat and I can try and answer it. Otherwise, if you just email me, because well, I know that everybody's very busy and we're literally out of time. Um, oh, she says it was a mistake. Okay, I don't need to panic. <laughs> that was good. I was going to link you in with John as well, because- um, That'd be a good idea. Yeah, I think that would be a great idea. Um, but thank you so much to all of our speakers and for Mary and John and Councillor Clark for giving your reflections as well. and. Um, Thank you, Catherine, for a brilliant chairing. It's our That's last event of 2020. If anyone would like to come on our trip as the group to Leicester in the new year, please let us know. I'm sure Councillor Clark will um, give us a nice morning tea when we come up and uh, we'll go around and visit some of the, um, the, the, the women who are mainly women who are working, um, have a chat about some of the work practices and just in general, um, you know, catch up with what, what is happening locally. Um, in terms of our homegrown industries and look at, you know, best practice challenges um, and where we go forward from here. So have a lovely Christmas, everybody. Have a sustainable one. Look out for your wrapping and your tinsel and um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll meet again in the new year. All the best. That would be Thank Catherine. You. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks, John. Thank Thanks, Tamara. Thanks, Adam. Thank you so much well to everybody for coming. Keep fighting.